So Mark, thank you for joining us for another Q&A. Obviously your second of the season and last month you did the BBC Silent Forum as well. Plenty of questions coming in as usual. We've narrowed them down to the sort of most asked 10. So we'll start off with off the back of Tuesday night's game. Will goal music still be played when fans return to Fratton Park? Um, the simple answer is no, um, but I'll, I'll just give a bit of background as to why we did it for this particular game. Um, it's just it's just pretty basic, really, that during you know the, the games we are in closed doors, we've scored goals, the atmosphere's dead in here without any supporters anyway, so we just thought we'd trial the goal music just to see if it spiced it up. Um, aligned with, we did a little video shot of, of the players celebrating scoring a goal that seemed to go down well and I know that was sat next to Ellis Harrison and Michael Jacobs and the rest of the team they thought it was hysterical so the actual celebration of the player on the big screen just a funny little clip is saying maybe we might keep um, that that seemed to go down well but you know unlike other clubs where they need the goal music to with a great respect to other clubs some of them that they need goal music to generate atmosphere after a goal. We don't. Um, so no, when fans are allowed back in sufficient numbers um, and we feel the time's right to pull that, we will pull it. Good to clear that up. How much money does the club actually make from iFollow per game? Well, obviously it depends on the game, but if you're in ballpark figures, it, it, the sums are not huge. They are low tens of thousands um, compared to obviously hundreds of thousands that you would make from normal match day revenue. So pretty poor but obviously at this moment in time however many tens of thousands are coming in it all helps but it, it's not it's not huge sums in the scheme of things. Sticking to iFollow somebody has said iFollow isn't the best are we still looking into streaming our own games? Yeah we're constantly keeping that one under review um, as I've just said we're only generating low tens of thousands anyway and clubs that do take their own streaming service it's you don't see a significant uplift in the figures because i know that there's an argument some would rightly put forward and say well i'm not going to subscribe because every time i've tried to i've had an issue um, we're consistently working with the efl and trying to improve the service but other clubs that have taken the decision to go along with it they because the technology just quite isn't there to supply a, a sky type service at this level on on what you can afford to invest into it um, they have issues as well and and they've spent many hundreds of thousands um, get putting the, their own service in where obviously we tag along on the back of the EFL stream which with there's only upside for us we just generate revenue but as I've consistently said it, although it's not our product it's got our badge on it and anything with our badge on it we we take a lot of pride that it is the best that it can be We'll continue to work with the EFL, but keeping options open, which we are doing, by the way, in discussing with other clubs and operators, um, alternatives in regards of forming our own digital stream moving forward. But it won't happen this season. I mean, it's, it's contracted this year anyway, so we wouldn't be looking to break away this season, but it's something we're looking at in the future. Good stuff. I mean, just, just um, as an aside, I, uh, I watched uh, Millwall last night on the red button on Sky. I didn't think that was particularly good either. You know, a combination of no fans, one single camera, um, the commentator was slightly out of sync, and, and that's on Sky, because unless it's the main game that's generating all that revenue, to, to put a game onto a Sky standard, you're looking at in the hundreds of thousands of pounds. But when you're on the red, red button, obviously you're not getting that incoming because it's not the main event for Sky. So they've, it's just really an add-on service. and and Correspondingly, you get the service that matches the level of income that you, you've got coming in. Good stuff. Have the club explored new kit manufacturers for next season, or is a new deal going to be in place with Nike? Well, we're very happy with Nike generally. Um, you know, the figures, even during lockdown, have been relatively good. Um, they've held up very well, and in part that's obviously due to the loyalty and support of our own fans in that regard. Um, we're keeping options open. So to answer the question, we are talking to other suppliers, but our preferred preference would be to stay with Nike. Yeah, you'd have to find someone pretty good to match the sort of Nike standards, wouldn't you? You would, and it's just the, you know, Nike could put their logo on many things and it just adds that little bit to it. Um, you know, and I think the mix of Nike brand Portsmouth uh, aligned with the University of Portsmouth just feels like a good 
mix and a good chemistry. So if something isn't broke, don't, don't try and fix it. Question here in regards to, I think, the switch from 4-2-3-1 to 4-4-2. Did someone at the club advise Kenny Jackett to change his style of play? <laughs> Listen, I don't think anyone needs to advise Kenny Jackett what to do in regards of how, how he sets up teams. Never, ever interfere. You know, like us all as a fan, you know, I may have my own opinion about a certain player or how he's playing or how a game went, but ultimately it's just an opinion along with every other supporter's as I've always said to you, perfectly entitled to an opinion, but it's Kenny that makes the, the ultimate decision, and, and that's right. And if you look at all the successful clubs, it's a, it's a poor mix when chief execs, chairman, directors, or even supporters start getting into the ear of a manager and he starts making decisions based on what is not his gut instinct. Um, we employ Kenny for Kenny, for being Kenny, for his record, for everything that we know he's good about him. Um, He's, he's fit with the club and really, you know, it's for him to make those decisions. Things have definitely sort of picked up on the field in the past couple of weeks though, and Pompey have been really enjoyable to watch, haven't they? Yeah, I think subtle things can, I don't think Kenny's ever set up not to, <laughs> deliberately going, I'm really going to upset everyone today. I'm going to set up a team, you know, that, you know, I, I think isn't, isn't going to win a game or, or perform well. So I think he does that. He's obviously... By his own admission, he's, he's said it, so I'm not speaking out of turn. I think he's, he's said that he, he, he knew he had the players. It was just trying to find for those first three, four games, you know, a system that was right for us. And we're into October now, and I think in October we've won five out of six games. So it was disappointing in the start. I mean, I'm not hiding away from that. We said, we made it clear, you know, the players as a group, the manager, myself, we all knew we had to really hit the ground running this year this year after the disappointment of the playoffs. Um, we didn't do that, you know, first two, three, maybe, I can't remember, fourth game of the season. We looked like we were misfiring, which was disappointing, but, you know, we were stuck with it and um, now feel like we've turned a corner. But as much as we don't get low with the first three or four games, we can't get high now from the games from what has been a fantastic October. So you just have to remain level-headed, calm, you know, see the bigger picture, generally in regards to the club and everything, and then make the decisions accordingly. But yeah, to, to answer your question, you know, it's been a great turnaround, but you know, you're only ever one or two games away from pressure being back on, and that is modern day football. From on the field to back off the field, what's happening with the ground? Are things progressing at the moment? Well, during this, this year, financial year, as you, as you know, we've spent close to a million pound again on the stadium just as we always promised to to keep it being able to function if you're talking more about the larger picture of what we'd like to do to the Milton end and, and obviously the larger Fratton Park development development talks are are ongoing continue to proceed and hopefully we can announce something at some point but I keep saying it's very difficult for me to make promises when it's out of our hands in regards of what we can do with Network Rail, the council and, and, and the basic infrastructure that surrounds Fratton Park. The salary cap has emphasised the importance of having a development team. When will Pompey have an under 21s or under 23s team up and running? And what is the long term strategy for our academy structure? And how does the club intend to develop opportunities for those coming through? It feels like the gap between our academy and first team is getting wider. We always get a few questions on the academy, so yeah. we've squeezed so, a few into one there. Yeah, there's quite a few questions here all, all rolled into one. So in regards of a, a development team, um, where we've always said that the cost of running the development team in the League One didn't really correlate with the cost of the League One budget. It was too high a percentage where we always felt that the money we had should be going directly into the first team to, to try and get out of this division. Um, now with the advent of the, the salary cap, it has changed it because under 21s, as we know, are excluded from the cap. So I think there's a very, very good argument now to, to have it in place for next season. However, again, it goes back to finances with a club at this moment in time, along with every other club that's in our case, losing somewhere in the region of £700,000 a month in lost revenue to then commit to an under-21 squad that might be costing a million plus to do... Again, it's £500,000 to do a development squad, but if you're looking at bringing under-21 players in that would be ready to step in in the event of an injury, there's no point in 
sorry, I just want to go back and clarify that. If you, that you, that's going to be expensive. To bring a players in at under 21 that are of the sufficient level that will be able to step into the first team in the event of an injury, you are going to have to get some of the best under 21 players around, and that is going to be very, very expensive. You have to align that with the fact that if it's a development squad, it's great developing them, but the second they go over 21 in that particular year, they fall within the salary cap, and if they're that good, you're going to lose them anyway because all the big clubs are going to be circling for them. So it's a very difficult situation, but the, the concept of having a development squad at this particular time, talking about next season, I think makes very good sense. It's going to be very expensive at a time, as I say, when we don't know when fans are going to be allowed back in and we continue to lose, lose huge sums of money each month. And, as, and the follow-on from that is our priority through this has been trying to keep the Pompey family in regards of the staff and the infrastructure and everything that we do together. Um, then then it's, it's part of a much wider debate, bigger picture that is ongoing with our board. But in isolation, yes, you are correct. But again, as I said, taken as a bigger picture currently in the current financial situation, it's not so much as a no-brainer as it might seem on the, on the face of it. Yeah, and then just for the sort of second part of that question, in terms of what the long-term strategy for the academy is, are you sort of satisfied with the work that's being done there? There are a few players who are maybe just on the yeah, cusp so, of joining the yeah, first going team. Going back to that, the question I think was, is, is there feels like there's a widening gap. I would disagree. I mean, Alex Bass has made the breakthrough into the first team last season. Um, We've, we've obviously got Ben Close, we've got Hadji that's knocking on the door, you know, had a couple of appearances in, in the EFL Trophy. I'm, he's very unlucky, actually, if, if he's that good a player that, you know, Callum's come in and Callum's done very well because, as we know, Hadji's a great player. Alfie Stanley's been on the bench for a league game, you know, been involved in others. So I don't think there is that widening gap. There's, apart from the years when the club was in, administration and really struggling and it, the, out of necessity it had to play Jack Watmore, Adam Webster and co when they were very young. If you look at our history since then it's just been a steady flow of one or two players every year that come through and start to establish themselves like like Jack Watmore you know been very unlucky with injuries but was even as a youngster coming through he established himself go back to Alex Bass you go back to Ben Close, Connor Chaplin came through did well got a move you know there's 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 a whole host of players that are coming through but and there's some in our current under 18s that are looking very promising as well so in regards of investment as i've said year on year we continue to invest more and more in the academy um, and it's not just about infrastructure or facilities it's about the personnel and the departments within that that we have expanded upon um, so no keep doing what we're doing keep that steady um, conveyor belt of players coming through and, and that will continue to be our strategy moving forward and if we do decide on a development squad I'm sure that will give even more opportunities where there is that platform to where we consistently hold on to maybe two or three each year and give them pro contracts and maybe there might be an opportunity to expand that out. Good stuff. Given the fact that fans look unlikely to return this season what are the plans to produce other income? Well we're already working on that um, as you can see, there's been a, a lot of work going into the memorabilia store, a lot of work going into a general retail store. We're doing all that we can with iFollow. Um, our commercial department has done an amazing job in consistently keeping the sponsorship levels high, even through the pandemic. So apart from that, you know, there's not a lot else you can do. And sometimes you've got to be careful because if we try and step out of that and try and develop some new commercial activities to try and substitute the the losses that I've previously mentioned and the loss of revenue each month I've consistently mentioned throughout the pandemic, then you know the fans get onto us a little bit by saying that we are too commercial. I've seen the comments online. So it's a really it's either a a great commercial idea to some people or it's Pompey exploiting the fans to, to someone else. You know it's so it's a fine line to tread but I think we we get the mix correct um, and we judge by what we sell you know so someone can you know hammer us for maybe something that we put on the Pompey memorabilia store but as we know we might sell a hundred of them overnight so the proof is in the pudding there were supporters there that wanted to buy them and just just 
hopefully get behind us, try and support what we're trying to do and um, and we'll keep coming up with ideas and just judging generally whether they are popular or not. Got a question here on the, the PFA and the salary cap, whether there's any update on that and also the plans for additional funds from the Premier League to the EFL, what, what can you say about that? So in regards of the salary cap, the, the latest information I have is that the PFA and the EFL um, obviously were at polar opposites in, in regards of a salary cap need. There was a, a slight coming together in that I believe the PFA accepting that there was a need for tighter controls and, and for clubs, especially not just during this period, but, but historically and in the future, need to address the huge losses that clubs are making and a, and a huge part of that is down to the contracts that the players are on. So I think there was a two months ago when it when it reached ahead, um, a little bit more of a coming to, together from both parties, a little bit more conciliatory from, from their starting positions and really apart from that, there was an agreed process to go to arbitration. Um, so we'll just have to see how that pans out, but I don't have any inside knowledge other than it has gone quiet, which leads me to believe that potentially they are starting to align more because the rhetoric seems to have calmed down quite a lot, um, which, which I think can only be a good thing. And as I've said, we're, we're against a salary cap in its current form, but as long as there were some carve-outs within the cap, and the big two for us are being able to offer our existing players contracts, but the new contracts, but they be treated at the divisional average, because otherwise very soon, as I've said publicly, we're going to be going to players offering them, in some cases, you know, half or even less of what they're already earning. And there's nothing we can do. That's the rules and regulations. So you could end up having a, a loss of our talent just at a time when we're potentially starting to come good and might have a great run this season um, where certain players are worth a lot of money. But because we can't offer them a new deal, we're going to end up having to release them at the, either at the end of the season because they're not going to want to sign on a, a, a vastly reduced deal or will be at the mercy of other clubs offering crazy low transfer fees because um, might be forced to take it because their contracts are running out and they don't want to be there and, and know the situation with the salary cap. Again, totally out of our hands, but we would like to have that ability to offer existing players new contracts that you know are, are equivalent or if not even an improved contract on what they're on, but are treated at the divisional average. Um, and we, we also, you know, we've said from the start that we are a bigger club by default than a lot of the clubs ourselves, Sunderland, Ipswich, Hull. There's quite a few clubs that our gate receipts, as an example, should be used as the metric for the, the salary cap that stops clubs getting into trouble generally, but acknowledges that some clubs are larger than other clubs in this league. What we don't want is a, a homogenised league where you've got a club on two and a half thousand average attendance being able to offer the same salaries as, as a club that's got a 20,000 attendance because the club with a 20,000 attendance, the expectation level of those fans is so much more than a club that's getting two and a half to 3,000. Yeah, and just on the funds from the, the Premier League to the EFL, obviously we saw Project uh, Big Picture is, is sort of dead in the water at the moment. Has there been anything else to come in to replace that that you've heard of? No, um, interesting to note that even without Project Big Picture, there's there's information coming out now that, you know, the top six have been talking about a European Super League anyway. So the irony is that Project Big Picture, which was designed to try and keep the pyramid together, um, we're, we're actually in danger anyway of, of the big clubs doing what they want. And a lot of that is going to be forced by the pandemic, suffering huge, you know, losses, tens of million losses. Um, I think Manchester United announced terrible results in the scheme of things quite recently as a result of the pandemic and um, they're, they're clubs like Manchester United they're going to want to go out and try and maximise their revenue to to keep them where they believe they should be in in the new world order of, of football so invariably I think that it's time for people really I've said this for a while for calm heads you know Greg Clark the FA Rick Parry EFL Richard Marston at the Premier League to come together with the government to try and find a solution. The, what, the acrimony we saw recently where the heads of the various footballing organisations, along with the government, and I use the word playing Punch and Judy, 
was unacceptable, really. Um, this is a time we should be coming together. Um, but unfortunately, during times of crisis, that's when cracks do appear. But it needs calm heads, needs people to get together. And there is a solution there. And I've, I've said from the start, I don't think the government should be getting off with this scot free. It's great to everyone turn their guns on the Premier League. But as I've just mentioned, clubs, there are starting to lose, lose huge sums of money. And without the prospect of supporters coming back, we'll continue to do so. So they're trying to preserve their revenue. And I know the government used the line of, well, there's enough money in football. Well, yeah, there is enough money in football. But Mr. Taxman, you take 50 percent of it. You know, the industry is in crisis. You need to come to the table and, and work with us on a solution. You can't just wash your hands of it, especially when they're taking, you know, even from Portsmouth since lockdown. It's, uh, I spoke to our um, chief financial officer the, the other day and he was saying to me that, you know, we've paid nearly two million pound in taxes since lockdown. It's not like we're there with a begging bowl. It's the government that are there with a begging bowl taking off money off of an industry such as football, where they're the ones saying that supporters can't come back into the ground, while at the same time allowing people to go to theatres and to cinemas and giving them huge bailouts. It just doesn't add up to me. You've got to be consistent, and they've not been consistent. On a slightly different... My opinion. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. That's what yeah, these are all about, Mark. Yeah. On a slightly different note, you've got the EFL Trophy final. Obviously, still hasn't happened. Um, fans sort of quite understandably are asking whether refunds are, are going to be available. We, we've answered this before, but just to, to clarify, has there been any update on it at all? No. Um, do I think there's been movement? There's no official update. Do I think there's movement? There is from myself and our board and the club in that we, from the, from the start of, of this pandemic, we were clear in regards to the FL Trophy that we wanted fans in there. We was going to give it as long as we could to allow fans to be back into Wembley Stadium to for hopefully another great occasion for the club. As the months have gone on, especially this last month, I have noticed a growing um, rumblings amongst our... I think our fans were aligned with that at the start, if I'm being honest. Um, Tony Goodall Fans Conference, we've continued to discuss it with them and all other interested parties, and, and they've agreed with our stance. But do I sense a change in mood that, you know, the end to this pandemic doesn't look like it's, it's coming anytime soon, especially when fans are going to be allowed back in, in, into a levels that we think would be worthwhile in, you know, in carrying on with that strategy um, to have at Wembley. So we are due a meeting very soon again. We stand regular dialogue with Salford and the EFL. Will there be a change from us? I can't guarantee it because we've not made a final decision, but my own personal gut feeling is, I think we now have to look at and face the prospect of the final taking place without fans at Wembley. And, and at that time, obviously, we would make the announcement and um, fans would be entitled to a refund. A question here from somebody who has asked, did the club actually bid for Ben Thompson or did they use the headline to fend off fan frustrations? Well, as always, we never ever so, you know, I, I read with interest the news, the, the 30 players that, or 20 players, whatever it might be, Pompey missed out on during this window. And I don't even know half the players on the list. So you have to be careful what you read. Um, we always say we don't make an announcement until we've actually signed a, a player for, for, for the reason there, that because you just become embroiled in speculation. Now, we never talk about players that are contracted at other clubs. We've got a fantastic relationship with Millwall. Um, personally, myself and the CEO get on, get on great. Club to club, you know, the owners get on great. So it's there's a lot of common links in, in regard to the passion of the fans, Millwall, Portsmouth as well. It's just, just you know, it's just a club that we we tend to get on well with, well, at least from an executive point of view. I can't comment on what goes on on a match day, obviously. Um, but no, there, there is a... Um, so we ca I can't comment about players at other clubs other than to say... Um, we know Ben, we know he's a great player. Um, I stay in regular contact with him. Um, and yeah, we want the best players at the club. So you know, make, make your mind up there. I'm sure people will be able to put two and two put together. Put two and two that. together, exactly that, yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the trust. But we would never ever just, uh, we would never put the name of a player out there to appease fans. It's just not our style and it's, yeah, it's just not what we would do. 
In, f in terms of the, the confirmed names that have come through, obviously it's five new signings. How happy were you with Pompey's transfer activity and what was a, a very strange transfer window, I'm, I'm sure, this, this time around? Yeah, no, very pleased. Um, good mix as we're always looking experience, up and coming talent. Um, took time as always for a few of them to bed, but on the whole, very, very pleased. Um, we went into transfer window day, two and two together. Um, you know, relatively, the day before transfer window day, look, there was one more signing we were trying desperately to get over the line and potentially would have got it over the line, but the the club that we were talking to about this particular player were at the mercy of another club and bringing someone else in so um it it didn't materialize but you know obviously disappointment that day um but we didn't want to rush and panic and just bring someone in for the sake of it because it's the window reopens again very quickly i think eight nine weeks it, it's open again we're already planning for that we have got a space or two you know within our existing squad um, to work with. And we've got, we, we have regular recruitment meetings, not just with myself and Kenny and Tony Brown and Joe Gallen, et cetera. We also have, you know, regular contact with our owners over, over it and targets and that, and um, sure that we're already, you can be sure that we're already working on that for January and, and for next summer as well, which is important. You, you want to get the talent in January that, could make an impact the following summer and, and not be left chasing around in the summer. So to answer your question, yeah, very, very, very pleased. Took a few games to settle in, but as, as we've seen during October, it seems like it's all coming together now and hopefully we can continue. But football is football. You know, you can, you can win six on the trot or you can lose six on the trot. It's just, just the nature of the beast and it's how you deal with that. And we'll just keep trying to deal with it as we always do try and get over the bad patches with which is our underlying principle of hard work and that's really sometimes all you can do if things are not going well but you believe you're doing the right things just work harder at it and that's what we've done during October. Well that seems like the perfect point to end thank you very much you've thank you. rattled through the questions this month and let's face it it has been a, a very impressive month on the pitch. Yeah great thank you very much.